Happy 2022 and welcome everyone. My name is Dave Miller, Little League Western Region Instructor and Umpire in Chief for California District 31. Welcome to our five part training series on the Little League Rulebook. These sessions are designed for all parties, including Little League presidents, board of directors, managers, coaches, scorekeepers, and most importantly, our adult and youth umpires. Feel free to share these sessions in groups or with individuals directly. I'm pleased to have with us Gary Grotman, who is a Little League Western Region Rules Trainer and fellow California District 31 staff umpire. Gary will take us through the rule book in these sessions and know that if you have any questions on the material, feel free to reach out to your local league UIC or even Gary and I at any time throughout the season. Lastly, but certainly not least, please know that Little League does not happen without our amazing volunteers like you. You're a significant part of the hundreds of thousands of Little League volunteers worldwide, and whether you know it or not, you're making a huge difference in your communities. So on behalf of Little League's Western Region, thank you and enjoy the videos. Okay, session number one, Gary, take it away. Good morning, Western Region volunteers and anyone else who may be watching our 2022 rules presentations. We welcome you and hope that these sessions will be informative for you. We are gonna start this morning with our session one, which is an overview of the general rules set up and things we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the umpire in rule nine and then talk about game management to some extent. First off in the overview, our general concept. We have five sessions that are intended to inform and hopefully engage Western Region baseball and softball volunteers. The rules and regs presented should be applicable and should be of interest to all the managers and coaches, our board members, our parents, and all the volunteer umpires that need to understand, that will need to understand in order to safely coordinate the children's baseball and softball games. The key word in this bullet is safely. Little League stands for this and every one of us should make sure that we're interested in the safety of our kids. We'll also include examples to demonstrate the key rules and a couple of videos to illustrate several interpretations. The outline of our sessions, as we're talking today in session one, we're gonna cover the overview, the umpire and the game management. Session two, we'll talk about the terms of art, the definitions and baseball pitching in rule eight. In session three, we're gonna talk about the softball emphasis and all of our softball umpire and management information. Session four will be the batter and the runner under rules six and seven. And then finally, our fifth session will be interference obstruction, which comes from multiple rules and multiple situations going forward. Our source material is the 2022 Little League Baseball Rulebook, which includes the playing rules, official regulations, and the operating policy, as well as the 2022 Little League Softball Rulebook. We'll actually be covering the significant changes to the 2022 rulebook in the course of our sessions over the next few days. Also, we will be using the 2021 Rules Instruction Manual as a source in, for interpretations. A number of Western Region senior instructors have gotten together over the years and put together the Rules Instruction Manual, which is intended to illustrate some of the common sense approaches and interpretations that come and are most appropriate to Little League Baseball and Softball. We'll also, where appropriate, be looking at the official baseball rules annotations, which are presented by umpires like Jim Evans, Harry Wendelstadt, and the JASCA Rotor series of information. These interpretations give us a lot of the fabric on how we want to move forward as of league officials. The significant changes for 2022. The definition of mandatory play at bat has been modified slightly to improve the clarity and make sure that everyone understands that the batter must enter the batter's box with no count and complete a time at bat by one of the four following criteria. Retired as a batter, being retired on the bases as a batter runner, or after reaching a base, the batter scores or the runner scores at that point, or after reaching base, the inning or the game ends. Regulation 6C in the pitching section allows a pitcher 
who has met his daily pitch count to be removed from the mound prior to the batter completing his at bat. The previous information said that you had to complete the batter or else you did not get the benefit of the exception. Additionally, another part of Regulation 6 establishes the pitch count for today's rest threshold is set by the first pitch to a batter. It's no longer the pitch at the end of the count to the pitcher. It's that pitch count at the first pitch to the batter. The pitcher may not start a new batter once the pitch count limit is set for the first pitch to the batter. And then there's been an update to the Little League official shoulder patch. The new unified patch, which matches the new program logo, reflects all levels of the program from T-ball up through seniors, and both baseball and softball. Former shoulder patches may still be used, and if you want to continue to use those shoulder patches in your league, there's some still available from Little League International while supplies last. There's always a question about what manager's options are, where I can find them, what's going on. There are basically three. On the illegal pitch, if the ball's put into play, the manager who is offended, in this case, the offensive manager has an option to accept the play or the penalty. Same thing on catcher's interference. If the ball's put into play, the manager has a choice. And lastly, an illegal bat situation, the batter will still be out or the play can be accepted, but there's not an allowance to not remove the position of the base coach as required by the penalty. Local league options. There are 13 of them that the board of directors need to take a look at. We've talked a little bit about them in the change and now they are part of the discussion that the local board of directors needs to take on before the season starts. First off, if you have an expanded roster and 15 or more players are at the game site, then the league may choose to reduce the mandatory play requirement to only three defensive outs along with the one at bat. We talked about the change in time limits that they've added a limitation, which we'll talk about later in the presentations that allows a complete game to be played at one hour and 45 minutes. And also we mentioned earlier, this will continue that a team can play eight players and can also start. And you've got to make a decision about whether or not that's going to be an out or whether it's going to be a bad, a batted position. We talked about batting order management. You can either have bat nine or continuous batting order, which is a, which is an annual requirement for the board of directors to take place. When you replace an injured or ill or rejected player, when you're using continuous batting order, you need to use the last out that was made. Minors protests must be resolved immediately, should not go to the board, but should be solved at that point in time. And when playing with eight players, the lead will determine what that ninth batting slot is gonna do. The league needs to determine whether they're gonna use the mercy rules, 10 run rule after four, 15 runs after three, both or neither need to be determined by the board of directors. The requirement for a foot to remain in the batter's box to speed play is a local option. And majors not advancing on a third strike not caught during regular season is also a board direction. Lastly, the special pinch runner management, instead of once per inning, the league can decide to take it down to twice per game. And whether the courtesy runner is gonna be allowed for the pitcher and catcher is a local league determination. Double first base is a local determination, and whether an ejection will occur if a team is, to, is found to be stealing or relaying pitching signs is a local option. There are also some board of directors only interest items. The local league may look at age appropriate minors players and choose those that are capable to play in the majors pool play system. These players that are allowed to play in the pool play system for the majors do not lose their minor division eligibility. As long as funds are not commingled and equipment is not used between programs, travel ball and other non-Little League programs may coexist with Little League programs. No representation of the Little League program is allowed in these non-Little League programs, however. And also, 
for majors and above, the minimum players on a roster is 10. Let's now move to rule nine, our umpire. As you can tell, umpires get around to a lot of places. When you are an umpire, you want to be protected and wear masks, shin guards, and chest protector. Males must wear a protective cup. 901C is a very interesting rule in that the umpire has unlimited authority to rule on any point not covered by the rules. When you do look at these 901C exceptions, I can almost guarantee that if you look hard enough, you can find a rule that'll cover the situation you're looking at. 901C is almost always a safety situation where the umpire needs to make a decision in view of safety. And also, if things get out of hand, the umpire has a very strong tool by simply putting the teams in the dugouts and suspending play until such time as league officials deal with unruly spectators. If you can't handle the unruly spectators or you can't find league officials, you simply leave the kids in the dugout and suspend the game until a later date. Hopefully the board of directors will take action in the interim to get things back on track. One of the best things that Little League did in the last few years was to determine if there's no adult umpire on the field, a game coordinator must be actively at the game site or the game cannot be played. The game coordinator may not be assigned to more than one game or field at a time, so his or her attention is exclusively focused on the game at hand. The game coordinator cannot be a manager or coach of either team, but could be any other parent who's present. So you can, there's no excuse if there's one parent at the ball game, that parent is fully qualified and ready, should be ready to step in as a game coordinator so the kids can play. The duties of the game coordinator are fairly straightforward. Attend to take part in the pregame meeting, not to override the umpires who are conducting the meeting, but making sure that all the safety elements and the lineup requirements are gonna be met. At times, in between innings and breaks in the play, oversee the conduct of all players, adults, and umpires. This goes back to that the game coordinator needs to stay on the site continuously. If things get out of hand, the game coordinator may eject any player or adult for unsporting conduct. Also, this is one of the key elements from a legal perspective that the game coordinator is the sole judge of when play shall be suspended or resumed. At the bottom line for game coordinators, our number one point is we need to protect our youth umpires, make sure that their experience is positive and make sure they keep coming back. Gary, I have a quick question for you. Sure, Dave. Just received this uh, question. Can the game coordinator be the pitch counter or the scorekeeper? The game coordinator should be exclusively assigned to the game coordination and the observance of all action on the field. To be some other collateral duty would limit the game coordinator's ability to stay totally focused. So the answer should be no. Excellent. Great question, and thanks, Gary, for answering that. Certainly. Our plate umpire and field umpire duties seem to be fairly straightforward. Plate umpire, ball strikes, and fair foul up to the pane of glass. That pane of glass is the front edge of first base or third base. Any decisions on the batter, controlling the lineup card, and then sharing, calling time, box, illegal pitches, or defacing the ball with his base umpire partners. The base umpires take care of the calls on the bases, Fair foul past the pane of glass if they're at first or third base line. Decisions on the runners, helping with the game management that the plate umpire is working, and also share time, box, and illegal pitches to facing the ball. Once in a while, especially in three or four umpire crews, we'll end up in a situation where because of a rotation error or some other mechanical breakdown, we'll have two calls on the same play. One safe, one out, for example. If we have this happen, the crew will come together in a conference and discuss the play. The umpire in chief will then render the call most likely correct. Big point of emphasis, this is not one umpire overruling another. It's simply the umpire crew looking to get the best answer that they can. If we have any problems, 
the umpires need to make sure that the board of directors and the league officers are kept informed. So within 24 hours, if you have any unusual situations, like a violation of the rules or regulations, ejection of any manager, player, or coach, or any other incident worthy of comment, you need to file a formal written report with the league president within those 24 hours. If one of those things is an ejection, the manager or coach will leave the game site immediately and for the remainder of the game. If you have a player who's ejected who is under 18, that player will only leave with the parent or guardian. If the parent or guardian is not present, put the player in a position in the, in the dugout where they're protected and also where they're not going to have a problem with continuing to disrupt the game. The adult and or player will not take any further part in the game and they cannot sit, the adults especially cannot sit in the stands and may not be recalled to the game. Also, any player, manager, or coach who's ejected from a game is suspended from the next physically played game and may not be in attendance at the game site either before or after the game is conducted. I'm going to take a second now and expand a little bit on Rule 9 talking about ejections. Every umpire, and often many adults, will, should develop a personal checklist that over the years sets a framework for how you manage volatile or emotional situations. You must be objective and base your actions on fact. It is a personal action to eject a player or an adult, but make sure that you have the full story. Talk to your partner if you need be. Remember those situations where you have the second person throwing a punch is the only one that might be seen where the person who initiated the problem gets away with not being seen yet. Look to your partner to get additional information if needed. And lastly, be convinced that the ejection from the game is righteous and still feel that way days later. Make sure you don't jump to conclusions. Make sure you don't have a bias that has carried forward perhaps. Your development as an umpire should include conversations with experienced umpires and mentors to help you develop this philosophical approach. Coming up now are some situations that umpires face and we all need to consider what they might look like in a, in a course of a game. Here we have a ground ball in the infield. The throw to first pulls the first baseman off the bag a little bit. And then there's a tag with the runner coming down the line slightly off balance. You look at the way the tag is made. You look at how the runner is proceeding. And it looks like you've got a tag which is firm, but not necessarily overly aggressive. The runner slips off first base and goes down. And what you've got is a baseball situation. The fielder did not bring his arms back, did not swing overly hard, did not try to injure the player. This is one that we see a lot more often. You've got a pitcher who is not happy with the strike zone. How are we gonna look at that one? Here we go. Pitch just misses on the outside. Pitcher's not happy. Come on up. Huh? What are you doing, man? What's going on here? A couple of seconds reaction is potentially understood. This is a big game. Top of the sixth inning. The pitcher's throwing a one hitter. He's had nine strikeouts already. Been working hard. He reached his pitch count limit, and that was his last pitch. So now what we've got is an unhappy pitcher. How far do you let that go? What can you do to correct it? What's gonna happen next? Those are all things that you and your partner work on. Now we notice the other team failed to get a pitch also. So it goes both ways. You need to try to work as hard as you can to make sure that things are fair on both sides. This one is a little more straightforward. This is not a little league game, but it is an interesting collision. You see the runner coming into home. 
standing up all the way, dropping his shoulder in, catcher makes the play, and gets somewhat destroyed by the runner's play. Now, it's not an absolute situation that would call for an ejection, but it is an unsporting act that needs to be managed in some way, shape, or form that the team needs to have. It. This one is a little more straightforward. It's a little more um, egregious, but it's also in the Little League World Series in a, in a tough, tough situation. Let's see what the umpires do in this particular situation. We've got a bunt. Pitcher fields the ball. Whoops. And the runner goes down. Both umpires call time. We've got an obstruction call. And the plate umpire is going over to talk to the pitcher. They determine that they're going to talk to the pitcher to fix the problem rather than an immediate ejection. Now, your threshold may require an ejection in this case. You may look at where you are in the World Series and say, that's not going to be what I'm going to do. This is part of your personal checklist where you need to be aware and alert for what's coming next. Your approach toward ejections and managing your game, objective, informed, righteous. That way, not only are the umpires going to be behaving in this fashion, but the managers, coaches, league officials, parents, all hopefully come to an understanding of how things are going to go as we move forward throughout our season. We're going to take a few moments now and look at the mandatory play requirements for the regular season, which are included in Regulation 4, Rule 2, and Rule 303. All players present at the start of the game will bat at least once and play at least six defensive outs. This is one of the bedrocks of the Little League program to make sure that all players participate in every game. So how do we define an at-bat for purposes of mandatory play? A player will enter the batter's box with no count and then be retired as a batter, retired as a batter runner, reach base and score, or the inning or the game will end. That defines the at-bat. An approved ruling, which has been added this year as a change, if another runner makes the third out on the bases with the batter still in the batter's box, the batter who was in the box when the third out was made must lead off the next inning. This is consistent with Rule 604, talking about how a bat, an at-bat is uh, handled for scorekeeping purposes and now makes it consistent throughout the different rules that a, an at-bat might apply to. Note, when appearing offensively for the first time, a player must meet the at-bat requirement. So if a player is showing up for the first time to bat, that batter must finish the at-bat in some way, shape, or form. Substitution administration under Rule 3. The substitution requirement is all players may re-enter the game in the same batting spot after their replacement has met mandatory play. A starter can be removed prior to meeting the substitution requirements. A starter may re-enter in the same batting position after his or her non-starting substitute has completed one at-bat and six consecutive defensive outs. A non-starting substitute may not be removed until she or he has completed the one at bat and six consecutive defensive outs. Note that for a starter, the outs do not necessarily need to be consecutive. Pitching substitutions. A starting pitcher who's inserted in the game must pitch to the batter or the substitute batter until that batter is put out. The batter or substitute reaches first base or the pitcher is injured and can't continue. If we have a substitute relief pitcher, that pitcher must pitch to the current batter or substitute until, once again, the batter is put out, the batter reaches first base. The inning ends or the pitcher is injured. Unannounced substitutes are an interesting situation that happened during the course of the game. 
adults get distracted. Players are excited to get in. They jump in without necessarily reporting properly. We end up in a situation where there are four situations where substitutes may enter the game that are not necessarily properly announced. For a pitcher, if you tow the pitcher's plate and throw one warm-up pitcher to the catcher, you are now the pitcher in the game. You've replaced the previous pitcher. If you're the batter, you take a position in the batter's box. You don't necessarily need to take a pitch. You simply need to take position in the box. As a fielder, you take a position occupied by the fielder you're replacing and play commences. As a runner, you simply take the place of the runner on base. One might wonder why play must commence for a fielder to take the unannounced substitute position. And that answer comes about because sometimes we have warm-up catchers who come out to catch while the normally assigned catcher is getting uh, prepared, getting his gear on. That is not an unannounced substitute because play has not commenced. Any play by legal unannounced substitutes will stand as correct. During the game, managers and coaches deserve the respect to coach their players and need to be watching the safety of their players at all times. Players, you need to have the sanctuary of being on the field, enjoying the game, and not necessarily listening to all the advice you might be getting from outside. So the idea is players, managers, and coaches stay on the field and will not address or mingle with spectators. And one bugaboo that has been a problem for many, many, many years, adults must not warm up a pitcher anywhere, anytime. A player needs to do that. Field conditions. Before the game starts, the manager jointly determines with his counterpart whether the field is fit prior to the game. One of the reasons this is the way it is is because it's usually the managers and grounds crew who are slaving away to get the field ready, either because of rain or other problems that might make the field unsuitable for play. Once the lineups are exchanged at home plate, the umpire in chief assumes this responsibility. The UIC or the game coordinator are responsible to suspend a game because of weather, darkness, or other problems. They determine when play may be resumed or terminated. Usually, the UIC will wait at least 30 minutes. This 30-minute number also comes up when we've got a lightning situation. You've got to wait a minimum of 30 minutes to let last lightning strike before you can resume a game. Ground rules. The league sets the ground rules to be followed by the teams in the league. Pretty straightforward. However, we must remember, ground rules cover the physical layout of the field and may never override the actual playing rules. If we have an injured player, they are permitted in the dugout during the game. The player should wear as much of the team's uniform as is reasonable. Sometimes it's only a cap, but part of the uniform ought to be worn. Any type of cast, including soft casts, is not allowed on the field during play. This means a player with a cast cannot coach bases, cannot collect the bats in between batters, those sorts of things. The, the player for safety purposes must remain in the dugout. These injured players, whether it's casts or just other injuries, are allowed to come onto the field to be announced and to take part in pregame pledges. We want to make sure that we keep our players, managers, and coaches focused in the dugout. For that reason, bat boys and bat girls are never allowed. If you have an instructional program, you may choose to have three coaches plus a manager assigned to that team. We want to make sure that we play the game on the field. No external communications are allowed in the dugout, including cell phones and cameras and GoPros. If a parent or somebody wants to put a GoPro or a camera on the fence, that's fine to record the game, but they cannot pass that information into the dugout in any way, shape, or form. Pitch counting and scorekeeping apps are allowed in the dugout, but not on the field. So you shouldn't have a third base coach keeping track of pitch count on his lap, on his uh, iPhone 
while he's on the field itself and shouldn't have a uh, clipboard or other scorekeeping information material. That way, the base coach's focus remains on the game and keeps his safety primary. There are special considerations for communications. If you've got a doctor, a law enforcement, first responders, you need to notify and communicate with the umpires and with the other team to make sure that those things are understood so these very important folks in our community can carry out their duties as required. Very quick question for you. Just came Never, in. ever is a manager responsible for the behavior of the spectators. The local league should provide protection to make sure spectators are kept off the field during the game. An umpire should never, ever threaten to forfeit a game due to the spectator's behavior. Suspend the game, put the kids in the dugout, and take action as best you can to defuse the situation while a board member is coming. Remember, Gary, we have a question for you, if we may. Please suspend the game and send it to the board of directors for consideration. Yeah. At the plate meeting, we have several events that are mandatory. The plate umpire collects the home team lineup first, then the visiting lineup. Compares the lineups, makes sure they're complete and identical, then declares the lineups official. What you should see is a position, a number, and a name, usually last name, and hopefully first initial. Each manager will then confirm that his or her team is properly equipped and ready to play in accordance with Little League rules. Ensure that both managers and the other umpires and, and the whole group understand which ground rules are in place and verify which local options may be used for that game. As we travel around to different leagues, each one may have different requirements for the local options, especially in the beginning of the year. Take a few moments to make sure that you understand whether or not a given local option is going to be in place in that game. Gary? Under continuous batting order, again, I stress it's a local league option to use continuous batting order. The player stays in that assigned spot for the game, whether you've got 10, 11, 12, 13 players, they bat in that order. Because they're all starters in a continuous batting order environment, each must meet mandatory play, but also can enter or re-enter the game defensively at any time. If we have a late arriving player, simply place that late arrival at the end of the batting order. Ill or injured players on the bases, use the player who made the last out in the previous inning or the last out that was currently made. If a player is ill or injured, you cannot finagle the system so that player only bats or only plays defense. The player for safety requirements has got to be a complete player batting and playing defense. If a player leaves the game and can't continue, you skip the batting order without penalty each time the spot comes around. If the player returns, place her or him in their original batting spot not at the bottom of the lineup. Two base coaches are required. They're mandatory. They should be out there as soon as the ball goes down, whether they're a player in uniform or an adult, as long as you've got one, dug one adult in the dugout all the time. Generally remain within the coaches' boxes. However, we all understand that the coach must vacate in order to allow a fielder to make a play on a foul ball or to retrieve a, a wild throw. Coaches cannot shift from first to third or vice versa in the midst of an inning. For safety purposes, whether it's an adult or a player, the base coach must remain in the dugout until the preparatory warm-up pitches are thrown down. And a manager coach who is a base coach should only talk to members of their own team and only in a positive sense. My rule no one will attempt to incite the spectators by you know, waving their hands, calling for cheers and chants and whatnot. Here's one that comes up every now and then and can get very ugly unless you nip it in the bud. Improper language, especially adults who are verbally abusing their own players. I can say what I want, it's my kid. No, you can't because the kids on that field right then are having a safe ball game, and we don't want to disrupt 
that flow. No one can try to cause a balk or legal pitch, for example, by calling time in the middle of a windup or something like that. That is prohibited. And you shouldn't distract the batter's line of sight by positioning fielders or waving arms or doing things that would intentionally bother the batter like that. Offenders should be warned. Don't do that. You know, let them know what acceptable behavior could be. Especially in a softball game, chance and chatter is fine. You can be as loud as you want, as long as you want, but targeted actions, i.e. calling out the pitcher by name, calling out the batter by name or, or position are not allowed, nor are crescendos and shrieking at key points in time. You can be as loud as you want for as long as you want, but you can't do things that are intentionally distracting. Every time that a runner legally touches all four bases in order before three are out, one run will score. Runs don't score if the third out is made before the batter runner reaches first base. If the third out is a force play, or there's a third out on a preceding runner due to a proper appeal. For example, if the runner on second missed third and scored, and the runner on first then scored, but the appeal at third base was the third out of the inning, then that runner who was appealed and is out would not score, nor would the runner coming home from first, even though that runner might have scored. Because the preceding runner was out for the third out, the run is not allowed. A regulation game is six innings, majors and below, seven innings for the older kids. If a game is tied after six or seven, play continues. If a game is called before six or seven innings, but after four or five are complete, three and a half or four and a half if the home team is leading, where a winner can be determined, it's a complete game. Less than four innings, you suspend and resume the game from the point of suspension. Remember, this is something that comes up many, many times. The mercy rules, the 10-run or 15-run rules, are local options to not enforce. They are not manager's options. After four or five innings, it's a 10-run rule. After three or four innings, it's a 15-run rule. If the home team's ahead, the game ends after the visitors bat in the sixth or seventh. If the visitors are ahead, the game ends at the bottom of the sixth or seventh when the home team has their third out. If the home team scores, the winning run the bottom of the final inning, the game ends then. If a home run is hit, all runs are allowed to score for that, uh, that final out. These are important distinctions. You have two outs and the home team scores the winning run in the bottom of the final inning. On a play where a batted ball drives in the winning run, where a forced play is possible, all runners must advance to their next base, removing the force. If you have a play where a walk or a hit by pitch drives in the winning run with the bases loaded, the runner from third and the batter runner must advance to their next base. The runner from first and the runner from second do not necessarily need to advance when you've got a walk or hit by pitch in that situation. But it's important to make sure that if a force is possible, those runners must advance on a batted ball. You'll see this once in a while, even in the major leagues, where they don't get to the next base to remove the force and the other team gets the force out, taking the run, the potential winning run, off the board. A suspended game will revert to the previous completed inning only in an exceptional case. It'll always be a situation where the visitors gain an unfair advantage and the home team doesn't have the same chance to score as the visiting team did. If the visiting team ties the score and the home team does not score in that uncompleted inning, the game will revert. Or if the visiting team takes the lead and the home team does not tie the score or retake the lead in the incompleted inning, the game will revert. Tie games suspended after four or five complete innings 
resume from the point call. Let's take a look at a couple of exceptions here. Game ends after five innings because of rain. The home team completed the fifth inning after the visitors had tied the score in the top of the fifth. Since the score is tied, the game is suspended to be resumed at a later date. We will start at the very top of the sixth inning with the score tied at five to five. In our second example, we've got a tie score after the completed fourth inning. The visitors score two, but the home team does not get to finish their at-bat in the bottom of the fifth. So therefore, what have we got? The game is suspended at the point it was called in the bottom of the fifth inning with two outs because we can never revert a game to a tie score. Third example, home team is ahead at the, at the end of a completed inning. In an incomplete inning, the visitors take the lead and the home team does not tie or go ahead in that fifth inning. So as I look at it, I've got two outs, the visitors up seven to six, but the home team did not get a full chance to bat in that bottom of the fifth. Therefore, the game reverts. In other words, the fifth inning is wiped off and the home team wins by a score of five to four. Note that if you have a game that reverts to a situation like this, the home team always must be the winner. You cannot revert and have the visiting team win. Tie games. Same batting order, same pitching arrangement, same substitution limitations. If the pitcher of record has required days of rest and the game as the game resumes, then that pitcher of record may continue. These games are often resumed prior to the next scheduled, regularly scheduled game between the two teams. Be aware of any pitching and catching restrictions that may carry over from the previous game. Rule 415 in the Little League Rulebook specifically states that the umpire may forfeit the game for these six situations. I would offer to you that because the Board of Directors is going to review each of these situations, the game is simply suspended. If a team refuses to start, the team refuses to continue, they fail to remove an ejected player or an adult from the field, they continually violate a rule, or they do anything to delay or shorten the game, looking for darkness to help them in the course of the game. Suspend the game, send a complete report to your board of directors. Protests. A legal protest should be used for a violation or interpretation of a rule or use of an ineligible player. When you boil it down, the manager is simply requesting that a decision be reviewed by the umpire crew. It's not an argument. It's not any kind of uh, situation that either the umpires or the manager needs to get upset, but simply they're asking for a review. Things that are improper on a protest would be umpire's judgment and equipment which does not meet specifications. We'll talk about equipment which doesn't meet specifications later, but those are not protestable. If you're in the middle of a game, even if a protest is improper, simply note it and continue play. Get the kids back on the field and get them continuing to play, which is the reason that we're out there. Let the board of directors worry about the situation and quietly and eat and conveniently review the rule book, review the situation, and render a decision that'll be fair for both teams. When we're looking at equipment, never ever shortchange the inspection of equipment and field conditions. The safety of the players, the adults, the umpires, everybody, their safety is impacted. Helmets, batting, catching gear, playing field. At the plate meeting, we all verify that the players are properly equipped and ready to play. Regardless of what's going on, the manager will always remain fully responsible for the safety of her or his team. Our playing field. Umpires, even if you've been there before, do a pregame walk around. Make sure the fencing is properly positioned with protective topping as required on the fence. Reasonably level, protective fences are 
in front of each of the dugouts and breakaway bases and required lines are in place. The ground rules should be understood. We'll take a look at the dead ball areas to make sure they're properly marked. Uh, take a look at the nets, vegetation, impediments identified. If there are any unusual conditions on the field, note those. And the plate umpire will set guidance for any additional ground rules that are noted during the pregame walk around if they're not covered by the home league. Our playing field. The lines marking the boundaries of the playing field help ensure reasonable game management. I'm not sure that too many of us would end up in a situation where a field looks like this, but just remember, when you're working in the local leagues, coordination with the local volunteers can help establish positive expectations for what the field prep is going on. Absent pristine field preparation ensure both managers understand how the game will be managed. As we look at this field, we can see that the line moving out toward the right field foul line does not necessarily line up. We don't have a runner's lane properly marked. We don't have a catcher's box in position. There are a number of things that need to be adjusted with the grounds crew before the next game is played. There are situations where it is so bad that you need to have the grounds crew fix it right then and there, such as perhaps this one. But let's take a look at getting the kids on the field and make sure that the adults understand that the umpires will be making the calls that are going to be the best they can make. For baseball bats, smooth rounded stick passing through the little league bat ring, wood or material tested acceptable little league standards, non-wood including bamboo bats, need to have a USA Baseball logo for majors and below or a USA Baseball BB Core logo for intermediate juniors and seniors. The bat's got to be dimensionally correct with no alterations including pine tar or sticky material or rubber end chokes. Action with a damaged bat, not an illegal bat, but a damaged bat is legal. Remove the damaged bat at the first opportunity without penalty. This could be a bat with a crack in it if it's a, a non-wooden bat or a wooden bat may begin to splinter on the large end of the bat. So just get those damaged equipment pieces off the field. Quick summary for majors, intermediates, and seniors about the maximum lengths and certification requirements. The certification requirements must be legible. You can have two identical bats, one with legible certification markings or other identifying information, and the other with the material, the information wiped off. The wiped off material makes that other bat illegal, even though they're identical. When you look at a batter's helmet, these are the attributes you're looking for. Cracks, make sure the decals are within standards. Noxy warning labels in place. All screws are in place, not locally altered. You don't want to have tape or other material to secure the padding in the helmet. You want to make sure that all the padding is there. If a player takes off his helmet intentionally while on the bases, that player's not out. But it should be warned about unsafe conduct. Helmet attachments. We're talking here about C flaps in general. Helmets and extensions should be from the same manufacturer, and the manufacturer needs to provide written notice to continue Noxy certification. Without written manufacturer certification, the pre drilled holes do not necessarily make the C flaps legal if they're coming from a different manufacturer. Face masks, especially in softball, are covered by the Noxy certification. Catching gear. Catchers must wear masks covering the entire head with a, with a dangling throat guard. Chest protectors and shin guards. The catcher's mitt can be of any shape, size to protect the hand, but it must be a catcher's mitt. Males must wear a cup. During practice and warm up, catchers must wear the mask covering the head with a dangling throat guard and wear a cup if they're squatting to warm up pitchers between innings or during a pitching change. When you're looking at the helmet inspection, make sure the padding is properly there. It's not damaged. There's no tape covering up areas. Screws are securely attached. 
decals are within the limits, no additional paint that was not put on by the manufacturer. The cage in front is not damaged and absolutely positively, the dangling throat guard has got to be in place. An umpire called time, any time that you have a serious injury to any person in the field, if somebody goes down, call time, and then you adjust the situation on the field once conditions are safe again. If the ball goes out of play, if you develop rain or darkness such that the game cannot continue, one quick rule of thumb on how dark is too dark. As the umpire, if you're watching the outfielders warming up, if you're having trouble picking up them, throwing the ball back and forth to each other in the outfield, that says they can't see the ball coming off the bat and it's too dark to continue. Anytime the manager requests time for a visit, substitution, or injury, umpire wishes to check the ball or review the game situation with another umpire or either manager. If an ejection occurs, it only occurs once play is completed, but then you call time and carry out the action required. If a player gains possession of a live ball and then carries it or falls into dead ball territory, we should call time. Two years ago, catch and carry was removed from the little league options. Even if the player does not fall while in dead ball territory, the ball has been carried out of play and time should be called. In order to put the ball back in play, the umpire has got to be satisfied the pitcher has the ball, is on the pitcher's plate, catcher's ready to receive, all fielders except the catcher are in fair territory, runners have retouched their bases after a foul ball, and a plate umpire calls play. Note, there may be situations where you want to put the ball in play, but the batter is not necessarily in the box yet. The batter does not have to be in the batter's box to put the ball in play. This may come up especially in situations where you've got a missed base or another violation of that nature, what is going to lead to an appeal. And folks, that's the end of session one. Dave, back to you. Thanks, Gary, so much. Hey, a quick question from, um, from one of our viewers here regarding helmets. Uh, they probably see it in high school and in, on the MLBs and even college. Uh, coaches wearing helmets on the bases. Is that required in Little League? Or what if there's a player coaching the bases? Do they have to wear a helmet? That's a great question, Dave. It brings up the point of every player on the field actively must wear a helmet, whether they're batting, running, or coaching the bases. Adults do not necessarily have to wear helmets on the bases, although they're perfectly free to do so if they choose. The interesting point comes up when you've got your second coach who is 16 or 17 years old is allowed by the rules, but that player, 16 or excuse me, that coach who is 16 or 17 must wear a helmet if they're coaching the bases. Back to you, Dave. Perfect. Well, great information today on uh, session one. Uh, I know I speak for our viewers and uh, we all look forward to session number two. So uh, thanks so much, Gary. And for all of you out there, we'll see you for session soon, uh, section number two, real soon. Thank you.